Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Hello, dear listeners. Today's topic is a sensitive one. We talk about body image, eating disorders, and recovery. Just wanted to give you a heads up. And if you are tagging along, today's conversation is one I wish I had earlier in my life. I'm sure many of you have a personal story related to body image and the pressure to look a certain way. I share a little bit more about my experience for the first time in this episode. I'm so honored to introduce today's guest, Mary Jelkowski, who's the author of The Gift of Self-Love, a workbook to help you build confidence recognize your worth, and learn to finally love yourself. Written like a letter to a close friend, this self-improvement book provides practical advice and exercises that will help you finally love yourself. She also has an online platform called Mary's Cup of Tea that empowers women to be more confident in their bodies and love themselves unconditionally. After recovering from an eating disorder herself, Mary started her Instagram account, at Mary's Cup of Tea to help women heal body image struggles and find self-love. Now, Mary is a published author, TEDx speaker, and women's self-love retreat host. And her podcast, Mary's Cup of Tea, is the top self-love podcast in the world. Mary's story has been featured in places like Teen Vogue, TEDx, and Health Magazine because, unfortunately, too many women know what it's like to struggle with self-love and body image. Mary is committed to changing this trend by inspiring thousands of women through her book, social media, podcasts, online courses, and worldwide self-love retreats. In today's episode, Mary shares how her body image issues started at a young age, how she started training for bikini fitness competitions until her body started rebelling and saying no, her recovering journey moving to Canada and tuning out the external voices, what were some of her tools and support system, how her relationships with her friends and family change afterwards, and how she hopes to help other women embark on their journey of self-love. Come tag along. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. I'm so excited about this conversation. I'm inspired by what you do and how you share your journey with everyone I just watch your uh your TED talk again and I I love it so much because I think a lot of us can relate to having you know attaching our worth to our bodies and you know growing up as women girls I'm sure men also get the same critique but as women it's like how you look or you should be you should dress a certain way you should behave a certain way and I've tiptoed around a time I've tiptoed a little bit around an eating disorder and I call it tiptoe, even though I know it's very close to one and it was disguised as healthy eating, but deep down, you know, when you're doing more harm than good. Yeah, for sure. It's like that line between like disordered eating and an eating disorder. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about yourself and how your self-love journey started. So my self-love journey started when I was quite young, but I feel like I lived a lot of lifetime since then, because when I was uh, in high school, I started competing in bikini fitness competitions. Um, And I had like a lot of body image struggles growing up and body dysmorphia and middle school was rough on me. And I really wanted boys to like me. And so it just kind of like escalated from there. And when I was 16, I started training for my first ever bikini fitness competition. And I just got really addicted to the fitness lifestyle because it was a way that I could be disordered and I could 
diet and exercise and be really strict with myself and miss out on social gatherings and drive my parents crazy. And I was also dancing full-time like ballet. And I could just kind of like disguise all of that over this pursuit of like health and fitness. Um, and so I always say like the fitness industry, at least the way I experienced it was a safe haven for my eating disorder. And it very much like encouraged it and escalated it. So, um, when I, after doing a few shows like that and doing fitness modeling and, you know, the whole industry is very big on social media and it's very image driven. And after doing that at a certain point, I hit a a breaking point where I don't know exactly what was happening, still trying to figure it out five years later, but it was just a point where my body was almost, it felt like it was fighting against me. Like it was like, I could no longer restrict it because I just kept binge eating and everything was difficult and I was so exhausted. And I remember sleeping for like 18 hours on end and waking up to like my mom pounding on my apartment door because I wouldn't pick up the phone for days and just like things like that. And so I um, sought help from a naturopathic doctor and she went through a lot of what I went through. So she was very much like a counselor and a friend and a confidant. And while she would be doing like my vitamin IV things to like get my hormones back and all my vitamin deficiencies and thyroid. And I had all the things I was in the hospital because my kidneys were like a disaster because of all the protein shakes I was drinking. Like it was just a lot on a very young, small body. Um, And yeah, I just started going on this like healing journey. And it was, when I say healing journey, I think most people think like, oh, sunshine, rainbows, books, journaling, candles, baths. And it was not like that. It was ugly. It was really ugly um, in a way that's like ended up beautiful in the long run. But in the moment, it felt so ugly. It was a lot of like, binge eating because my body was trying to make up for like all the starvation I put it through. Um, it was a lot of tears because I just felt so ashamed. I, I kept feeling like I failed. I didn't really have anybody to tell me that like, it's okay to gain weight. Like your, your sole purpose is not to like lose weight, suck air and die eventually, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I went on this healing journey journey. I moved to Canada as I was just telling you. Um, that was the same time. Um, I really, I felt like I read something that was like, you can't heal in the same environment. You got sick and where I was living was just, it was just a lot of like gym people that I would see all the time. And a lot of like, things that I didn't want to be and didn't want to be around. So moving to Canada was like the best thing for me. Um, I started spending a lot of time like just on my studies and hiking and trying to figure out my place in life and navigating this new, really intense relationship I was in, which was a whole different story. But I kind of found my stride that way after I stopped (laughs) destroying my body. So sorry, that was a lot. I know that's a great way to start. Tell me a little bit more about the bikini competition world. As I shared with you earlier in our conversation, my eating disorder was disguised as healthy eating. And I think even now in the fitness industry, a lot of people are in it thinking that it's healthy, but they're doing more harm than good to their bodies. So is the bikini competition world very similar where you know, everything you're doing is to make your muscles better. You get more energy, you know, all the side benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it's definitely one of those things that it just looks so glamorous and so healthy and like, there's no way it could be bad for you, but in inside and beneath the surface, it's just like obsessive. Um, And it's the difference between like, I'm doing this because I want to, or I'm doing this because I feel like I have to. Um, And so with the, with bikini competitions and fitness, like it's really hard to recognize that there is something obsessive about what you're doing when everybody around you is like, oh my God, you look so good. And just like applauding you and the likes on social media and, you know, even things like old 
friends, not even friends, like the popular girl from school reaching out to you and being like, can you personal train me? Um, Just like that kind of weird egoic satisfaction that you get from like, I guess, achieving what society sees as like this quote unquote, perfect body. Um, And of course it, it comes with a certain type of high. And I think a lot of people who diet or who have ever experienced any kind of disordered eating or an eating disorder, actually, I would say, even if you haven't, like think about how you feel when you're hungry. It's weird. A lot of women, especially I think just because we face so much pressure, but a lot of women feel a sense of accomplishment when they're Mm -hmm. hungry, right? Like, like think about those mornings when you wake up, you like skip breakfast, you had your coffee and like you're, you're at a yoga class and you feel like you just did all the right things. You just checked all these boxes. Um, and like you're winning at life and it, it's this weird high. I mean, if you really think about it, it's a little sick. Cause it's like, why am I actually feeling good about being hungry? Like that should not <laughs> make me feel good, but it does because we've been so conditioned to believe. And we've just been so encouraged to believe that we need to eat less and exercise more and take up less space and lose weight. And, you know, it just it, depending on how your body is, but like, I'm the type of person, like if I'm sad, like I, I will lose a little bit of weight, but everybody around me is like, Oh my God, you look so good. Um, yeah. not friends, but like, you know, distant relatives or like, I know my mom's friends will do this. And I'm like, actually I've been battling some severe depression and that's caused me to lose weight, but nobody talks about that. And nobody thinks that. And then meanwhile, on the flip side, if you gain weight, it's like, Oh wow. So bad. Yeah. Like what is wrong with you? Like you there's so it. much shame attached to it. And there's so much, you know, congratulations and good affirmations when you're losing weight when you're skinny but like the moment you add on a pound that's when it becomes like it just it separates you from people when they make comments like that but it's so harmful because you know so many women have the same dialogues in their lives but they don't notice when they're also projecting it back to others so it becomes like a self-enabling system yes 100 percent um and that's how it is in our, just in our society, I guess, how we've been, we've been raised to believe that dieting is like, I mean, name one person who's not on a diet. It's kind of hard, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm in the, you know, the body positive space. I'm lucky that most of my friends are, are very into that. But a lot of people these days, it's really hard not to not to he- go a day without hearing something like, oh, I need to eat better or this or that. But it's just become very common. We don't question it. Yeah, definitely. How was the transition between kind of going down that pathway where you know, like deep down, you know, it's not good for you. And then, you know, you mentioned talking to your natural path and realizing that all these different things you were doing that were just guys as good has let you down to a path of not the greatest like how did you cope with the realization that everything you were doing kind of being dangled in front of you like oh crap (laughs) oh it was rough yeah it was rough it was like a whole identity crisis I was like this fitness girl um and I can't say that like overnight I was like oh maybe like gaining weight won't be the worst thing in the world like for years I would logically know that like okay, I'm recovering from an eating disorder. It may be okay to gain weight, but still the old thoughts would like come up about like, oh, I shouldn't be. And I need to start working out again. And maybe this is too much. And for a while I had that thing where it was like, it's okay if I gain weight, but not too much. And so just putting these restrictions on ourselves, And again, it's just like restriction and these societal norms and the numbers that we attach to like I don't know if do you, have you ever had like a number on the scale or like a number of calories or a number of minutes that you yeah. have to work out yes. right and you're like if I go well depending on what the context is but like with the scale it's like if I go over this number that's it I need to start losing weight I'm getting serious or like if you're exercising I need to meet this number or else it's not a good workout yeah. if I don't have an hour I might as well not do it at all like we get very attached to it and it's not like we're born with this, right? Like we just learn these things, like what constitutes a 
good weight that we want to weigh or a, a good workout or how many minutes we need to do hit exercise or, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. So the transition was really rough. Um, it was just a lot of like fighting with myself, a lots of self-talk. Um, and you know, the first few years, like your body is still just changing all the time. And so some days were better than others, but most of the days were like, I can't believe I let myself go. And, I feel like such a failure and nobody's going to like me and my body was just changing so fast. So it was really difficult, but I just kept telling myself, I'm like, the more I try to like diet again, the more I try to exhaust myself again, the longer this process is going to take. Um, and so that's what I kept just like holding on to that if I just let my body be, if I start trusting it, then eventually it'll start trusting me again too. Right. How did your support system look like? Mm, I, so I had just moved to Canada and I was um, with my boyfriend at the time and he was really supportive in that sense. Um, I mean, he didn't quite understand it, but he was definitely like, I love you no matter what could not care less. He was not materialistic at all, farthest thing from it. Um, and he would always just order an abundance of food. And of course, the other part of me would be stressed out by that. I'm like, that's so much food. But, um, but it was nice to have just somebody that did not care about what I look like in the most genuine sense, without putting a limit to it. Um, and so that was really important for me. And aside from that, I had one really good friend who was my lab partner in university. Um, and she actually went through her own eating disorder and recovery. So, you know, she was always there to remind me and social media, at least once I found like more positive accounts, like was a big support system for me. Cause that's where I started learning about a lot of the things about diet culture and fat phobia and how it's rooted in discrimination and racism and um, just social injustice and against, um, what is it called? Like the patriarchy. And that was like really big for me. And luckily my mom was also really supportive. So yeah, I felt, I did feel supported most of the time but of course when you're going through anything difficult like that it's like you do feel really alone you know mm -hmm. even though people are like there for you like they don't fully get what's inside your head so yeah. you know a lot of the times you do feel alone mm -hmm. did you seek any additional help especially because it takes so much time to recondition yourself like logically when I I toss out my um, my scale years ago, maybe like 10 plus years ago, because I realized what it was doing to me. I would wake up, I would look at it, and then sometimes I'll be happy, and then sometimes I'll be like, oh crap. And then I realized, how can this scale dictate how I feel and my worth? But the journey from understanding it to fully embodying it, it, it takes a while to get there. So I'm wondering yeah. for anyone who might be experiencing anything similar to a degree, what were, did you? talk to a therapist or like any kind of external support like that? I did a lot of coaching. I just started working with a therapist recently for other things. So I'm about a year into like good old therapy and I'm a <laughs> big proponent of that. So 100%. Um, but I did a lot of coaching in terms of like more like life coaching, but I was really blessed that the coach that I had, she um, also had her own experience with an eating disorder. It's crazy. Everybody, everybody has some, something, yeah. right? Um, so she she was really supportive. And I, I did like a lot of um, programs that were all centered around self-help. And so through that, like, because my healing journey was so unconventional, um, you know, I wasn't like, I didn't do the stereotypical therapy or treatment centers or anything like that. I kind of had to like carve my own way. So I took a lot of these like things you would read in a self-help book and I'm like, okay, well, how can I apply this to my body <laughs> um, and my mm -hmm. body image and things like that? So I was able to like carve out this way for myself, which also correlates 
relates to the work I'm doing now. Um, and so, yeah, I never thought about that until you asked that, but I suppose I wouldn't be where I am now if I didn't go the unconventional way. Um, because like I said, I had to like, I had to just take the, the information that you would learn in like a coaching course or self-help book and create like this, almost like a customized curriculum for myself right. um, and my, my healing journey when it came to the relationship I had with food and my body. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's also so empowering because there's no specific ways on how to heal or how to do certain things and knowing that, yes, you can seek help when you feel right. And you can also find help your own way and power. It's almost like you're tuning out all the other voices and noises that you had because I listened to a few episodes on your podcast, Mary's Cups of Tea, and you shared about how your body image and insecurity started at a very young age and you were going to the gym and thinking about bodybuilding at around, was it 13 and 14? Yeah. So you had a lot of external input at that point. So it's kind of like so encouraging for you to see like, okay, this is where I'm at and I can take my power back and be very patient <laughs> as you navigate through that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Were, were you able to like, like who was really big in your journey or how were you able to like, what even inspired you to throw away the scale? Because I, I mean, that's a hard thing to do for a lot of people. I think it really helped me. I've always been very, um, very connected to myself and who I am. And I try not to attach myself to what people think, even though it does affect you. <laughs> um, and I was following this, um, this yoga instructor. Her name is Tara Stiles. She was like the first person I interviewed for this podcast. And I think she talked a little bit about the skill and body image and something clicked with me. Like, I can't let the skill control me. But the thing about my journey of recovery, I've never really shared this publicly because I, I, I always thought that I tiptoed around it, but never like fully dived in. But I know I was like, you know, if your ankle's deep, you're already in it. So I had some like binge eating later on, but it started with being restrictive and calories counting and healthy. So I didn't restrict myself like in quotation in terms of what I would eat. I would just limit the amount, but I would have like one piece of chocolate cake and that would be like delicious. And my turning point was it came to a thought came to my mind when I was having that cake. And I was like, if I eat the way I am till the end of the year, I'll be so skinny. And then another voice came that said that you will be miserable. And that was like the start of, okay, let's not attach myself to the food. Not let's not be so restrictive, but it takes time to recondition. There were still moments where gaining weight was kind of scary and then understanding the shame that came with it. And I think I started reading about um, Brene Brown's book, The um, I'm Blanking on Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do people call it? It's around here. But <laughs> she was talking about being vulnerable and embracing your emotions. And for me, I think the binging started when I, I, I was feeling so many emotions, but I didn't know how to handle it or hold space for them. So you want to kind of just numb it that's how I use it. I know everybody goes through it differently. Yeah, definitely experience that. I also read, um, I think it's The Gifts of Imperfection by Brené Brown. I don't know if you, if that's the one you were referring to. She has, I know. she has so many. She has so many, but that's in my to read list. A friend sent it to me years ago. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a to read list that's like a million miles long. It's overwhelming. I I <laughs> There's know. so many books to read, so little time. <laughs> uh, so the books of imperfection, what was that about and how did it help you? The gifts of imperfection was, um, it was, I read it years ago. So my memory is pretty vague, but just about all the things that um, we've been talking about, just learning to accept yourself and how some of these so many things that you see as like your flaws are not, <laughs> they're actually your gift. Um, they actually could be your strength. Um, 
you know, they're, they're what make you, you. So as cliche as it sounds, um, the book has just more like practical and research based stuff. Cause obviously Brene Brown is a researcher and mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it was a good read. Um, trying to think of like some other books that made a difference for me and that time. Um, cause I, I did read a lot like a lot, a lot, obviously books like intuitive eating, um, just all of, all of the stuff about rejecting diet culture in general and, and learning how to eat and make peace with your body and eat in a way that feels good without thinking about it, just how we were when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of like practical stuff like that I read and of course, a lot of spiritual approaches to it too, because it is a lot about like, self-acceptance and surrender and not attaching, like you said, to your identity um, and what what people perceive you as, which is a lot of like Buddhist ideology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did your family and friends react at once you started to kind of come back to yourself and in your healing journey? Did your relationship with them change? Yeah, of course, I was no longer a bitch. Um, so I'm not allowed to cuss on this show. <laughs> yeah, you are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because like the thing, dieting makes you mean. Like you're mean when you're hungry um, <laughs> or when you hate yourself. Like a lot of people think that like, you know, there's that whole thing about self-love is selfish. And if I like myself too much, I'll just get fat and lazy and ugly. And it's just so not true. It's like when you don't like yourself, if you think about it for a moment, who are you thinking about all the time? You're like thinking about yourself all the time. You're just criticizing yourself. You're worrying about what other people think about you. Everything revolves around you. And when you're actually like at peace with yourself, you can just be present with others. Um, And it doesn't take away from your connections. Um, So in that sense, it's just the most paradoxical thing that people can say that (laughs) self-love is selfish because really when you don't like yourself, you're bitchy. But um, yeah, I have my friends and family. They were really supportive. Um, I was was in Canada a lot of the time, so it wasn't like we're that close. Um, I mean, we're still close over the phone, as close as you can get. But I just started finding new friends and I ended up eventually moving back to Arizona so I was able to find like a new environment in the same place because I was big on like, you can't heal in the same environment you got sick. So I created a new environment for myself after moving back and just found new friends. Um, honestly, I'm not friends with anybody back from <laughs> my old fitness days because unfortunately most people are still stuck and remain stuck for a long time. Um, and yeah, now I'm just so grateful to say that my friendships are very empowering um especially with my you know my female friendships there's no longer this thing of like I'm fat oh stop girl I'm fatter like those kinds of conversations there's none of that um and before what me and my friends used to do is just literally diet and go to the gym and worry about what we look like and it was just mind numbing (laughs) and now like my, my relationships are more fulfilling. It's beautiful. Once you, and you started sharing about your journey online and you went viral, how did that feel? Because suddenly you're healing, you're able to help others, but then you're getting all these extra voices and noises. Did that trigger anything? Was that overwhelming to be so vulnerable and open? Um, yeah, yes and no. I, uh, when I started sharing, it was really cool to see a lot of people being like, oh my gosh, I've been through that too. Um, and just my story started picking up and a lot of people could relate to me and, um, it just, it felt really good. It was a big part of my healing is knowing that I was helping, uh, other people. So I always just, I think I started living more by everything I was learning when I felt like other people relying on me because I'm very much a helper I think I'm what is the Enneagram like two and three or whatever yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) um 
So it just, it felt really good um, to know that it wasn't all for nothing and that like the, my pain could be my purpose. So that was great. And then I just started like, I don't know, I started sharing more writing and, and videos and speaking and started hosting retreats and connecting again with more and more people that have gone through the same thing. And it's just been the most rewarding thing I ever did. I was looking at some of your retreats. Tell me about your self-love retreats. Um, they are the most wonderful, amazing experience you will ever, ever, ever go on. Um, it's just, it's magical when women come together and they're all like-hearted. I used to say like-minded, but somebody said that, no, it's okay to like have different opinions and stuff, but it's the heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a bunch of like-hearted women that come together and they're all there for a similar reason that they just want to heal and find more self-love and they don't see like the beauty in themselves and then everybody else does. And the same person has that same experience. So just being around a bunch of supported people. And plus you're in like a really cool place. Like we've done retreats in Bali and Sedona, um, California. We're going to Costa Rica this summer, hopefully. Of course, the <laughs> pandemic has changed a lot of our plans. And so you're just surrounded by nature and good energy. And we do self-love workshops. And the workshops that I host are pretty intense. So we usually have really emotional morning and then very fun afternoons um, and deep connecting evenings. And so it's just, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I, I brought together everything that I love the most, which is like people and traveling and these transformational workshops that I host. And I was able to like bring it all and create self-love retreats. That's amazing. When was the first retreat you've ever led? It was back in 2019 to two years ago. Two years Maybe ago. 2018. No, 2019. Yeah, two years ago. Um, we did one in Sedona. And then shortly after, I did one in Bali. Mm -hmm. um, the Bali one was really cool because it was eight days long. It was a longer retreat. Um, and there were 17 people who came out. Um, and we all got tattoos at the end. It was the coolest thing, like totally unexpected. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> what yeah, a it was fun. Experience. And then we went to San Diego and then we had one planned for Zanzibar, which is in Tanzania. And unfortunately had to cancel that because of mm. pandemic, but it's okay. We'll come back. <laughs> You've also been doing ritual retreats for the for the past yeah. year as well. Mm. Yeah, I've been able to create virtual retreats, um, you know, just to stay connected somehow. Um, and also last year, uh, I was working on my first book. So I took like the the teachings I, that I would do at the retreats and I created a workbook. So there's like, it's not like you just read it, but you can write in it and you can do the exercises and the self-love challenges. And it's kind of like going on a mini retreat, but on your couch. <laughs> perfect, perfect lead. And I was going to ask you more about your gorgeous book, The Gift of Self-Love. What, I guess you already explained a little what inspired you behind it to create it. What do you hope people will get out of this book? Um, I hope that, I mean, a lot of the few chapters are focused on body image. Um, so I, I definitely hope that people find a lot of healing in it in that sense. Um, but overall, like, I just hope, especially for, for women, I hope that we just drop all of these, <laughs> I like to call them like other people's expectations, like mm -hmm. let go of all these expectations and pressures that we put on ourselves to either fit beauty standards or check boxes or make a certain amount of money or buy a house by the time you're 30 or have this like dream job and just a lot of things that are rooted in societal structures that 
are, well, arguably for the good of society. So of course we're way better off now than we ever have been. And, you know, we really don't have that much famine, even though we're in the middle of pandemic and, um, you know, we don't get killed in wars and we have a sewer system, like we're better off in so many ways, but what's good for the society is not necessarily good for an individual, especially, um, individuals who are very, you know, empathetic and soul driven and sensitive, which I find myself being a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just hope that women will read this and just find a a breath of fresh air and they're able to apply a lot of the principles and, and do some of the self-love challenges and start just shedding their, that old skin. I, one time I was hosting an online retreat and I'm like, picture it like you're a snake and you're shedding your old dead skin and somebody unmuted themselves and they're like um you mean a caterpillar turning into a butterfly I'm like yeah that would be a better analogy that would be a better metaphor (laughs) both works both Both animals are beautiful (laughs) yeah unfortunately not that many people like snakes (laughs) the snake one I guess we can all relate to the butterfly metaphor because it's just so much more beautiful. But even I think they've shared it um, in a band mastermind about how butterfly when they're inside a caterpillar or no, the caterpillar inside the pod, they completely Mm -hmm. destroy themselves (laughs) before they emerge a butterfly. That analogy of how sometimes, you know, you know, you're healing and it's not linear. Sometimes you have to kind of let go, destroy everything before you come emerge into something else who you're meant yeah, to be for sure oh gosh um you shared a lot of fun be- uh, reels with your sister Alana all the experience that you've had do you feel overly protective to make sure that she doesn't follow that path that you had How is your approach with her? I know you love her so much. (laughs) Yeah, my little sister and I are really close. We have a 10 year age gap. So I'm in that weird space where I'm like, obviously I'm not her mom, but I'm still like her big, big sister. And um, yeah, I used to find myself feeling like overly protective. But the thing is, my sister is a lot cooler and more confident (laughs) than I ever was. Um, So she's like, I don't know, she just she's the most accepting person I know of other people. And I'm a firm believer in like perception as projection. So just seeing her being so accepting of other people really shows me that she is really accepting of herself. Um, you know, funny story that I tell that I actually share this in my book, but one day, um, my mom was like, Alana, your room is so messy. You need to go clean your room, blah, blah. blah. And my sister's like, mama, it's not my fault. I'm messy. It's just because I'm so creative and I have a creative mind. And she was 10 when she said this. So she's just very good at just recognizing that like, yeah, I'm not perfect and I'm a little bit of a slob, but that also like is the gift of my imperfection. Um, So she's really, really fascinating in that way. And I also just have a lot of faith in these Gen Zers. Um, A couple of days ago, somebody asked me like, what gives me hope? And the first thing that popped into my head is these young people. Um, I mean, I kind of, I guess, fall into that, but I just feel like people that are my sister's age, I mean, don't get me wrong. They're mean and there's drama too. And like, (laughs) you know, stuff happens. But I think when I spend time on like TikTok or I hang out with my sister and her friends, like I'm just really impressed at how I think just a little bit more compassionate they are and more encouraging. And if somebody says something mean on TikTok, then like, I feel like on Instagram, if somebody is is criticizing somebody, then a lot of people come in to criticize with them. But when I spend time on TikTok, it's the opposite. Like people come in defense. They're like, how dare you? Like, you know, and they're very big on protecting people and planet. And they're very big on finding purpose um, and not necessarily buying into that. So that's just what I see. Maybe I just see like a lot of the positive side of it. Um, But yeah, I am really, I try to instill that in my sister that like, your body is perfect and you don't need to change. And I hope it resonates with her. Um, She's gone through like her own fair share of middle school growing up struggles, but overall I'm just really proud of her and how, how she is and who she is. 
That's so beautiful. I siblings relationship are the best. You just can't describe it. My sister is five years younger, and I'm always so protective of her more than I am with myself. Like I had a therapy session where、um, my therapist was like, "Okay, imagine this happens to you. Like, how do you show your anger? How do you like show?" And I couldn't really think of something.、I'm、like, I'll just leave. She's like, "What if like you need to confront someone?" And I couldn't really think of something. She's like, "Okay, who can you channel?" And I thought of my. Little sister who's five、mm-hmm. years younger, but she is so fierce.、I'm、like I can channel her, and if something were to happen to her, that's when I get the most fierce. It's just a protective side of me.、So. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> fierce. That's such a great word. Were you、fierce. always that close to your sister? Ah,、uh, I think it got better once I came to Canada. <laughs> Distance makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> and I was here for university. She was still back home in Peru. Um, but as we get older, I think that's when you can relate to the childhood traumas, <laughs> to a lot of the things growing up. So yeah, it definitely yeah. happened later. Yeah. What about you guys? Ah,、uh, yeah. I mean, maybe it was just ten when I moved back from Canada.、Um, but yeah, I can't wait until we're older and we can be like, "Oh, you're messed up too. Let's talk about it." <laughs> like、yeah. just a little bit more authentically, because obviously she's still younger right now, but. And I also can't wait to party. And she has no interest in partying with me. Like I said, like she's a lot cooler than me, and she knows it. <laughs> and I do get offended. Like she won't answer my texts. Like <laughs> it's just our relationship has gotten a complete one eighty.、Um, so I just, yeah, I can't wait until we get we have an adult friendship too. Oh, and you can travel together. Oh, has she joined you for any self love retreat yet? No, she's a little young, but hopefully, you know, in a few years, she's definitely asked before. Yeah,、um, yeah. Hopefully, when she turns like eighteen, she'll be able to to do more stuff with us. But yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything. I wanted to wrap this up with some、um, rapid fire questions. Ooh, <laughs> you can take your time. They're rapid fire, but you can think about them. Okay. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, so something more like physical. I love when people compliment my voice, um, because it used to be my biggest insecurity, and now I've been since I started my podcast. Um, a lot of people have been like, "Your voice is so calming," and that just means the world to me because I used to not like my voice. Um. And so yeah, that's something a little more physical. And other compliments, I don't know, just on my writing and my speaking, and and、um, yeah, things like that. My writing, I think, especially so, anything to do with words. Like if people are like, "This thing you said really landed with me." That's like music to my ears. I'm gonna add on to your voice compliment because as I was listening. You speak and share your story. I'm like, you are so calming. I feel so calm and grounded right now. That means a lot to me. Thank you. <laughs> I did do voice classes last year when I was preparing for my TED talk,、um, because I was like, I came to my voice coach Natalie. I'm like, I want to lower my voice. I want to deepen it. And she said something like, instead of deepening it, let's just. Ground it or something, or let's like step into it.、Um, and I really like that. Like again, it's not really about changing yourself; it's just more about stepping into who you really are, which is what your message is about. Yeah, shifting. Oh, I want to ask you a little bit about your TED talk instead of giving it away because I want people to listen to it. It's so powerful. How was the process of preparing for a TED talk? Um, it was great. I was really grateful that、um, the the directors of this TED Talk they were just very、uh, hands on and supportive. We had practice sessions. They gave really、um, really great feedback, so I was able to revise and along the way. And I had support for from my voice coach, which also let me practice. And I also did Toastmasters, so I practiced there. And Yeah, overall, my my talk was only ten minutes.、Um, of course, I was so nervous, and I was I was very well prepared、um, because it was just the best thing that ever happened to my career, especially at that point.、Um, and yeah, it was a great experience overall. Like, can't complain about a single thing. I was really nervous, but it was my first time like speaking on stage in front of that many people、Oof. and in that setting. And yeah, just. 
It's, it was fantastic. You were great in it. I'm going to link it in the show notes so that everybody can watch it as well. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that, Jessica. Um, a book that's changed your life? Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed. What does coming home to yourself mean? Um, hmm. Coming home to myself means that I was always home um, and that it was never like somewhere else. It was always like within me and that I can create that level of acceptance and groundedness and peace all within myself. What do you want more of? Mm, travel. I miss traveling so much. <laughs> we're currently building out a van. So we're going to be traveling cross country and I just want to see more waterfalls. And as I said that yesterday to my boyfriend, we're driving, he's like, well, there's a waterfall. And I'm like, babe, that's an effing fountain. It's not a <laughs> waterfall. There is a difference. You can't just point out our neighbor's little fountain structure. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to be like near water and oceans and yeah. trees <laughs> oh, you reminded me of we went to with my family to one of those travel tours and they're like we're gonna drive three hours and see this waterfall and once we showed up it was like this little pit on the ground with water flowing and I was like what that's it <laughs> like yes it's beautiful spring water tastes delicious but it's like not even up to my knee <laughs> it's a pond yeah it's a right. pond <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> any advice for younger self um for my younger self this is hard um just stop stop caring so much about what other people think about you and yesterday I saw that was like when you're 20 you care a lot about what other people think about you when you're 40 you stop caring what other people think about you and when you're 60 you realize that nobody was thinking about you at all <laughs> yeah I'm like okay be 60 <laughs> we can do it now yeah <laughs> we can embody that now exactly <laughs> like we are the hardest on ourselves yeah where can people find you i'm mary's cup of tea across the board on instagram my website mary's cup of um my book is mary's cup of tea.com slash book i am on the tiktok although i'm pretty bad at it um <laughs> And yeah, You're the so Mary's good cup or of bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not a Gen Zer though. I don't know. These kids do these cool transitions, and I'm like, well, it's cool. But yeah, and the Mary's Cup of Tea podcast, which is my my pride and joy. I really really enjoy podcasting. Uh, what are your current offers and programs, retreats? Um, a retreat coming up in July in Costa Rica. That one's about 75% full. So depending on when people are listening, a few people might be able to grab a spot if they're interested. And just the book, the, the gift of self-love, um, pre-ordering it would mean the absolute world to me because um, all those pre-sales matter so much, unfortunately, in the Amazon algorithm. <laughs> but aside from that, I just, it would be really cool if as many people as possible got the book on the release date, which is March 23rd. So if you pre-order it today, it's technically supposed to get to your house by March 23rd. Um, so yeah, that's again at maryscoopofteacom slash book. And I hope you like it. It's the most beautiful thing that I've ever created. And all thanks to my publisher. They did such a fantastic job with it. Um, I don't know if you've ever read The Artist's Way. I know. I've heard of it. It's in my list. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like that morning pages practice. And it's for anybody who's like really creative. Well, I, I love the work. Um, and we modeled like the texture of the book after mm -hmm. The Artist's oh. Way. Um, so it, it's like. It's like tactile. It, feels good yeah it oh. smells good like it's I really wanted it to be something that when you're holding it like you just feel so like embodied in your self-love journey mm, I love that there's nothing like picking up a book and smelling it and feeling <laughs> it sounds yeah. very weird but you know what I mean <laughs> you'll see the video um the video that I created my mom's in it and the first thing she says was oh it smells so good <laughs> <laughs> yes Mm -hmm. Looking forward to that. Thank you so much for sharing your story today, Mary. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate it. This was fun. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.